Now it's a uh, it's a difficult topic. It's a topic that's going to raise a lot of emotions for us that we really do need to be thinking about um, those the emotional context of everything that we're going to talk about tonight. But death making is isn't something new. Quite a few people have said to me, oh, you know, in terms of social work theory, then this idea of death making, this must be very new. Perhaps it relates to specifically to the COVID-19 pandemic. No, it's not new. Actually, the uh, process of death making, what goes on within death making isn't new, but neither is the theory behind death making. So um, I've been a qualified social worker for um, 31 years or so, and I... When I trained, we didn't write a dissertation, we wrote an extended essay. And my extended essay was all about death making and how that was happening for, um, particularly uh, for adults with learning disabilities. And the um, concept really of, or the word um, that was coined by Wolf Wolfensberger, who developed the um, theory of normalization, which is more recently referred to as social role valorization. There is, I think, such a lot for us as social workers to learn from Wolfensberger's work. Um, and if you want more, you can go to wolfwolfensberger.com and there's lots of information there about his work and there's lots more information about death making. So if it's something that you think you would like to theoretically explore a bit more, then there's one space that you can find out from it. Death making was actually quite a controversial aspect of his work. And what it was that the word, the phrase that he put together of death making was he wanted to, he said, he wanted to reflect the many ways from direct ways to indirect ways in which people's lives could be, the word he used was people's lives could be abbreviated people could be made dead. This was the phrasing that he used. And he wrote about death making, but he had to self-publish it because no publishers would cover the topic. And it was very, you know, the language of the day, very inappropriate language now, but he referred to a genocide of people with disabilities. He had to publish it itself because no publishers would touch it. People didn't want to hear about it. People didn't want to know about it. But actually, in many ways, what he wrote about in the 1970s, late 60s and 70s around death making was very insightful and very relevant to the day, but still very relevant now. You know, one of the things that he did, he recognised, he said that hospitals in the uh, time that he was writing in the 70s had become very risky places he said, for people who were devalued. He said there were lots of reasons behind that. He said, you know, when you're um, sick, when you're ill, it reduces your capacity and potentially uh, your competence. He said that also the complexity of contemporary medicine leads to lots of medical errors being made. And he also said that medical personnel often hold very negative attitudes about the value of the lives of people with disabilities, all of which he said, endangers devalued people when they're in hospital. So anybody who is in, who is devalued by society, the phrasing that he was using, are, uh, he said, in danger within hospital. So he wrote, and again, he self-published a book of instruction and advice for people who want to protect devalued people in hospital to make sure that they will come out alive. He titled that a guideline for protecting the health and lives of patients in hospitals, especially if the patient is a member of a societally devalued class. Now that's a quote from Susan Thomas writing online about Wolf Wolfensberger's work. But I suppose what I'm wanting to show you here is death making is a hugely relevant concept. It's nothing new. It's been around for a long time. We know that it's happening and we know that it's been happening for years. So where's the social work voice in all of this? What's going on for social workers? Having seen this happening for years, what is it that we're doing about it? If you've attended our webinars regularly, you will know that I have said many times that one of the best books I have ever read about social work. And I, you know, I've been a social worker 31 years. I've 
my training was a four year course. So I've been doing uh, on a journey from social work since I was 18 and I'm 53 now. So it's been a long time. This is one of the best books I have ever read. If you haven't read this book, you need to get this book. Caroline Aldridge. Now, Caroline joined us for a previous webinar that uh, she talked to us. We were really fortunate that Caroline came and led us through values-based um, practice in social work. But there's lots of things about, although Caroline, I think, doesn't use the actual word deathmaking in her book, for me, there's so many examples of deathmaking within the book. And this is a quote. I wanted to start with a quote from this. Um, book because it is so important. He died waiting, learning the lessons. Caroline writes beautifully in this book of the tragic story, well, it's a horrendous, uh, you know, experience. And she talks about, it, it, it brings alive her family's story, but added to it, it's the most beautiful reflective writing. And it also brings in lots of reflections on social work. And Caroline says this, she says, I've become increasingly aware that the deaths of some people largely go unnoticed. People who have a mental illness or learning disability, those who are dependent on drugs and alcohol, the homeless or the poor might die prematurely without a thorough investigation. There might not be any formal review by the agencies responsible for the delivery and the scrutiny of services. Coroners do not hold inquests for every death. There's a lack of societal curiosity and outrage, which mirrors the low value placed on marginalized people. Preventable and predictable deaths occur too often. Deaths in my community, in care homes, in hospitals, deaths on the streets or behind closed doors. Some people are deemed to be of so little worth that their lives and their deaths are mere whispers. It's so emotive. We are social workers. We are here about people. It's what we do. We have to become outraged about this. We have to do something about death making. We need to explore it. So deathmaking is a phrase that was um, coined by Wolfensberger and um, Frederick Engels. So again, nothing new. Frederick Engels talked about it in 1845, but described it instead as social murder. So Engels said that people with social and political power, the elite, create conditions that result in premature deaths. Of poor, of poor. So this quote, Frederick Engels, when capitalists force workers in a condition that knowingly leads to death, it should be called what it is. It should be called what it is, murder. Engels describes social murder as being more of an act of omission than commission. So more of an act of not doing something than doing something. But essentially, this is what this is all about. This is about processes of devaluation that lead to death. This is a life and death issue. This is a social work issue. Social work is a profession built on human rights and social justice. And the right to life is the fundamental right. It's the most fundamental right. There's nothing else without it. And we're surrounded by examples of death making, social murder, whatever we want to call it. These whispered lives and whispered deaths that Caroline Aldridge talks about. But where's the social work voice in all of this? How much are social work students talking about this? How much are your educators talking about this. I've heard people say, oh, you know, social work, it's not a life and death thing, is it? You know, we're not like the emergency services, it's not life and death, but it is because human rights are life and death issues. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. This is an issue that you don't see theoretically talked about in any of the theory books, you don't see it there, but 
Joe Finch and Prospera Tedham and I specifically wrote around death making in SHARE. You know, we've done a previous webinar on SHARE, haven't we? We've looked at SHARE as a model of social work. And specifically in that book, this is a page from the book, we, we pulled out research that demonstrated that devalued people are at risk of early and very often preventable deaths. We know that. We know that adults who are devalued because of a learning disability or because of a mental health problem, we know that austerity, which is a political choice, brings about death. We know that. We know about the very high suicide rates that we have. We know about the way that life expectancy is linked to socioeconomic status. We know that. Think about traveling communities and what we know about early death in traveling communities. Think about what we know, Black Lives Matter movement. Think about what we know about the deaths of people who are devalued. And so this is a really significant link with anti-oppressive practice. And it is theoretical. That link is there. So when we're talking, it's a practice-based issue and it's a theory and we need to start bringing it together. And I want to hear students thinking about it, talking about it and exploring it in their reflections on placement. Those of you who are students who are here, I want you to think about this and how it links with the work that you're doing on placement. There are loads of significant points. There is so much research that links into this. So, for example, you know, in the webinars that we've done about dissertations and things, people have said, you know, I'm struggling to find a dissertation topic. There's, you know, what, what can I find that has enough research but isn't really something that's been done in social work today? You know, it's not been done loads and I want to come up with something original but that also has research. Well, you know, there's a lot of research in this area. And there's very little been done about it in social work. So why not think about looking at an area around this? We know from, um, you know, st statistical analysis. So we know from the Office of National Statistics and so on. So we know this from mortality and life expectancy trends in the UK. And this shows us a number of key points. So we know, for example, that since 2011, improvements in life expectancy in the UK have stalled. And for certain groups of the population, life expectancy has actually gone into reverse. And that's largely about poverty. So this report represents a new analysis of mortality data, exploring what's happened, who is effective and what is driving the current trends. So the analysis uncovers worrying trends, including a rising number of avoidable deaths among the under 50s and a widening gap in life expectancy between the richest and the poorest. So all the statistics are there, they're all there to tell us this, but there is no single cause, the analysis tells us, of the slowdown. And that means there's no single solution. It's complex, this is a complex area. But we do need, as a society, to take action on the wider factors that shape the conditions in which people are born grow up, live, work and age. And that's what this year's World Social Work Day theme is about essentially, no one left behind. Remember the message of you know, World Social Work Day in March, no one left behind. We've got to create these different conditions. And as social workers, that's our responsibility to think about these things. We're not simply assessors. We are more than that. We do a lot more than that. So we know that particular groups of devalued people are disproportionately affected by death making. So this is from the um, fact sheet from the World Health Organization about premature death amongst people with severe mental health problems. So you can read it there for yourself, but we know people with severe mental health problems on average, according to the World Health Organization, tend to die earlier than the general population, referred to as premature mortality. There's a 10 to 25 year life expectancy reduction in, in people with severe mental health problems. So you have a mental health problem, you've got this like huge 10 to 25 year life expectancy dif difference. 
The vast majority of those deaths are due to chronic physical medical conditions such as cardiovascular, respiratory and infectious diseases, diabetes and hypertension and suicide is another important cause of death in this group. Mortality rates amongst people with schizophrenia is two to two and a half times higher than the general population. People with bipolar mood disorders have a higher mortality rate ranging from 35% higher to twice as high to 50% higher as the general population. 1.8 times higher risk of dying associated with depression. People with mental health conditions do not receive the same quality of physical health care as the general population. So people can look at this and say, oh, you know, this is a, you know, a, a death from natural causes, but this is preventable. The majority of deaths of people with severe mental illness that are due to physical conditions are preventable with more attentive checks for physical illness, side effects of medicines and suicidal tendencies. How many people do you work with who do not get good physical health care? How many people do you work with who are not accessing and not being given access to the same kinds of checks that people in the general population? We know the World Health Organization tell us that interventions do exist to promote mental and physical health of people with mental health problems. And there is a need for increasing access to good quality health care. So we know this is really significant for people with mental health problems. It's also a huge deal for people with learning disabilities. Um, you might recognize here um, Heidi, who is a disability rights activist, who was a figurehead of a recent uh, legal case, which was all over the news. So you may have seen it, which argued that part of the UK Abortion Act is discriminatory. Whatever your thoughts are about women's reproductive rights, it seems to me that this is a clear example of death making. And it's one of the things that Wolfensberger would have said. So the termination is allowed up to 24 weeks but it's allowed up to the point of birth where there is a substantial risk that the child would, the law says, suffer from such physical or mental abnormalities as to be seriously handicapped. I mean, it's terrible language. It's, it's really offensive language. But this is really stuff that we need to be thinking about. We need to think about the ethical considerations here. We need to consider what's going on in terms of life and death of the people that we work with. Social work is about enabling people to live good lives, but also good deaths. And that means avoiding preventable deaths. One of the other books which I have uh, just found so um, impactful um, in recent years is um, written by um, Sarah Ryan, who's been a guest at our webinars um, previously. Um, and Sarah tells the story of um, Connor Sparrowhawk, her son, um, in the very moving book, Justice for Laughing Boy. And so there's two books that I would really suggest to you, if you've not read these books, read these books. It's not like reading a really difficult textbook. These are beautifully written books. These are the stories of people's lives. These are books that are just so important for you to read and learn from as social work students, much more important than any textbook you're ever gonna read. The lives of people, because social work is about people's lives. So I've tried to give a bit of an introduction there to what is this concept of death making? Because so many people on social media, since we put out this week's webinar topic, have been saying, well, what is death making? What does it mean? I've wanted to give you some kind of introduction there, but it's so wide. There's so much that we could be thinking about. And we've got two uh, fabulous guests with us tonight who are going to talk a little bit more and illustrate some of the elements around um, processes of devaluation and death making and how this um, links together and how it is a social work issue. So our first guest I'm going to hand over to um, is um, George. So if I can hand over to you, George, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, did you want to go to the next slide? Sure, sorry. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone, and um, thanks very much for the invite, and I hope that you'll find um, the little bit I've got to say useful. Um, this picture was a gift that my friend Liz commissioned from a Twitter friend, Becky, um, who drew it, um, and the words are from another Twitter friend, Stephen, 
And um, I'll just read it in case you can't see it. And it says the light in the darkness, each one has worth, each one has value and each one is loved. And this drawing um, is well, it's very special to me because it was a gift and um, it demonstrates, it, it kind of, I guess it shows a little bit about what I do. So we've got a film that's going to introduce my work in a moment. So I'm not going to go into any great detail, but to just give you a very quick introduction to who I am. Um, I um, have a background in special education and learning disability. I did a PhD um, many, many years ago um, and looked at education for children who are profoundly and multiply learning disabled in England, Wales and Ireland. Um, I then worked as a university lecturer. I then worked at the stats office um, and then I worked at RIPFA Research in Practice for Adults, um, a knowledge transfer organisation that works with local authorities and social workers. Um, and I was there for a number of years. Um, and then about almost 10 years ago now, um, I left there to look after my dad at the end of his life. He was terminally ill. And um, I set myself up as a freelance knowledge transfer consultant. And shortly after my dad died, Connor Sparrowhawk, um, who Siobhan's just mentioned, um, his mum Sarah's book, uh, Connor died. And I didn't know um, Sarah. I didn't know Connor. I never met him. Um, but I, when uh, Connor died and... Sarah was tweeting she was sharing about the report that was a report that was coming out into his death and I got in touch with Sarah and said you don't know me from Adam I'm just this weird woman on the internet but um I have known we've all known for 20 odd years that learning disabled people are dying decades prematurely and it's just not right um can I do anything to help you raise awareness of what's happened to Connor and what followed was uh, the best times, the best work I think I've ever done in my life um, in Justice for LB. We worked together for years um, to try and get justice for Connor. And I know that you've had a webinar from Sarah before, so you have heard some of Connor's story. Um, and I think what I'll do now is I'll stop talking. And if we could play, um, there's a video which the BBC produced a year ago about my work. And if um, Brett is as kind to share that, um, I think it gives a better overview than I can in four minutes. So. People need to see us, to see that we're human. Dying it may have nothing to do with your disability. And where's justice for that person? On average, men with learning disabilities die 22 years before non-disabled men. For women, it's 27 years. So we know if you have a learning disability or autism, you will die decades before someone who doesn't. That just doesn't sit right with me. Hi, I'm George and I live tweet coronial inquests. I share what happens in court in the hope that if people are more aware of how learning disabled and autistic people live and die, they may care a little bit more about them and about their lives and why people are dying decades prematurely. George attended all of these people's inquests and tweeted every minute. George Julian, in my view, is an open justice champion. She ensures that deaths receive scrutiny, which otherwise would not. It started in 2015. Connor Sparrowhawk was a fit and healthy 18 year old. He happened to have learning disabilities and autism and epilepsy, and he drowned in a bath in hospital. And I became involved with thousands of other people with his family and friends campaigning about Connor's premature death. We were talking about how hidden Connor's death was and that's where the idea grew with George live tweeting and telling the story day in day out. I don't think I will ever forget the moment that the jury returned a verdict. I sat in court in floods of tears trying to type what followed but with such a palpable relief that the jury got it, that Connor's death was entirely preventable. From there, family started getting in touch with me. George's court work is crowdfunded. Being in court itself is incredibly draining. I literally try to tweet as much of what is said verbatim. I come out and I, I'm fit for nothing. I can barely hold a conversation. George recently started working with these campaigners. They let us join one of their sessions. Our group is called Stopping People with a Learned Disability is Dying Too Young. We've been doing like um, case studies when people die too young to see what they've been dying of. Dying of, of aspirate pneumonia may have nothing to do with your disability. 
property. It may have something to do with the people that are educated looking after you didn't yeah. look after you properly. George recently started working with a new family. Coco is the youngest person who's in Questwood Cupboard. She was only six when she died. Coco had autism, but that didn't define her in any way. She was very loving. She had a little thing we used to call hurty hugs. She would squeeze you that little bit hard and you knew that she was gritting her teeth at the same time. Coco Bradford died in hospital four years ago. A report found that doctors failed to treat her dehydration. The Royal Cornwall Hospitals Trust apologised for failures in her care. When you go through this process, the first few months, everyone's really sorry for you. It gets to the point where you don't want to talk to anyone anymore because you don't want to spoil their day. But George does know what you're going through. Coco deserved the very best of care. She came along at a point where I was just about to give up. Bereaved families are in a position where they're having to go through this incredibly difficult process examining what happened to their loved one. Uh, they also are placed in opposition to other bodies who may not necessarily wish to get to the truth. I guess the dream is that I reach a point where learning disabled and autistic people aren't dying decades prematurely, where bereaved families aren't contacting me. But until we reach that point, I can't imagine not doing this work. Coco's inquest is set for later this year. George will tweet about it. Thanks, Brett, for saving our Wi-Fi issue. <laughs> so that video, um, I, I'm just very privileged that the BBC produced that, that they were interested in the work I do. And so I wanted to share it with you because I think it's a far better um, explanation of what I do than I could possibly fit into four minutes. Um, so thank you. Um, and we had a bit of a problem playing it earlier. So I'm very grateful that we managed to sort that issue out. The other reason I was really keen that we played the film is because it talks to some of the people um, whose inquests I've covered and whose lives have been lost. Um, but it also includes the voices of um, the amazing Stopping People Dying to Young group um, who are up in the Northeast and they are just phenomenal, the work they do. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you had a little chance to hear from them as well. Um, and you should definitely dig into them and have a look at what they're up to um, if you're interested in the topic. Um, so I've just got a few slides to talk through. Um, I'm not going to introduce any of the people um, whose inquests I've covered in any detail because they were um, some of them are mentioned in that film. But I wanted to just kind of step back and take an overview look at this death making in relation to learning disabled and autistic people. And um, what I will just say, though, is Coco, whose mum was on the film there, whose um, inquest, it said in the film that the inquest is later this year. It actually happened in December. Um, so we had two weeks Um, I had a three-week inquest in Kent of a young lad called Sammy Elgin Stanley in November and December and then Coco's inquest in Cornwall um, for two weeks in December and her inquest concludes um, on Friday. So at the moment the coroner um, is making his deliberations and deciding he's heard all the evidence we've heard from the witnesses and he will decide um, what happened to Coco and where they make some findings of fact and decide um, how and why she died. Um, so that's coming up on Friday. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, it's at Coco Inquest. Um, so this um, this picture in front of you now is um, a very bad um, craftivist banner, which I did when I first started stitching. Um, and it's a quote from Catherine, Catherine Runswick Cole, um, uh, Professor Catherine Runswick Cole, who's at the University of Sheffield now. And it just came up in a conversation on Twitter when we were talking about um, what happens basically and what happens is abuse happens people die something goes wrong there's a committee there's an inquiry there's a report and lo and behold we do it again um Chabal mentioned that Wolfsburg's work was you know decades ago um and what I've got um on the next slide um if that's okay Siobhan, thank you um it's just some of the reports that we've heard about so Ely Hospital was 1969 that's 53 years ago Normansfield was 1978 the death by indifference report from Mencap from um, Beverly Dawkins when she was there, she did brilliant work and that was published in 2007. That was followed up by the Michael inquiry in 2008. A few years later, we had Winterbourne View, um, which 
was at the year after that, CIPOLD was published, a confidential inquiry into premature deaths of people with learning disability. The Mazars Review there from 2015, that was thanks to Sarah um, Connors and Connors family who insisted that all the deaths at Southern Health were investigated and looked at um, and found that only 2% of learning disabled people's deaths were investigated by the NHS Trust, 2%. Um, out of the Mazars Review came the CQC Review, Learning, Candor and Accountability, which really should have been called No Learning, No Candor and No Accountability. Um, it looked at how NHS Trust um, identify, investigate and learn from the premature deaths of people um, and in short they don't um, and there's been a programme of work ever since for the last five years and I'm not sure it's any better if I'm honest. Um, another report, a CQC out of sight report um, came out in 2020 about the restraint, seclusion and segregation of autistic people and learning disabled people. Um, again, horrific. Uh, these reports, I'm not, I don't mean to make light of them, they're important reports, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of words all saying pretty much the same thing. Um, and then the most recent one there was from um, the Norfolk Safeguarding Board, the Corston Park um, Safeguarding Adults Review that was published um, at the end of 2021 that looked at the deaths of Joanna, John and Ben, and um, three people who died in Corston Park, an assessment and treatment unit, a so-called hospital in Norfolk. Um, and it, it was carbon copy almost of what happened in Montebourne View. I mean, this is this is the thing. We it is as Catherine said, committee inquiry report repeat. We we know um, we just know that um, we can predict what's going to happen next. And I just say, you know, do we know enough yet? How many more reports do we need? How much more do we need? Um, how many more people need to die? How many more investigations need to be performed? Um, and um, I've just seen a comment in the chat there saying reports need to lead to action and they absolutely do but they never bloody do in my experience so I think what we do is we have a flurry of um, a flurry of action but it's performance it's performative scrutiny it doesn't actually stop people dying we know that learning disabled people are the life expectancy gap is getting worse not better and we've known for over 50 years about it so I'm, I absolutely agree they should lead to action but I think there's a role for social work there to ensure that perhaps that they do um, so in terms of how learning disabled people die, um, this is a pretty grim slide, um, but it just gives an overview. These are what's in included in the CIPOD report and the leader reports. People are dying from poorly monitored and managed epilepsy. Um, I covered Connor's inquest. He obviously died. He drowned in a bath. Danny Toza, who died in Mencap's care. I use the term care, use that term loosely. Um, people dying from late or non-detected cancer, which wouldn't have killed them if it had been found early enough, if there had been effective screening, if their symptoms had been noticed, if they'd been treated. Um, people are dying from, um, lots of people die from respiratory diseases, pneumonia, aspiration, pneumonia, flu, illnesses which on the whole people don't die from, and we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, people die from aspiration, which I, I, I struggle to imagine a more horrific way to die. Um, where you inhale food or saliva or your gastric contents and it, you inhale it into your respiratory tract, um, which in turn leads to an infection um, and you uh, suffocate really. Um, so, and I have not done a number of inquests. The most recent one was a, a man called Peter Seabee, who, um, whose inquest I covered last year. Um, and Peter died as a result of aspiration. Peter aspirated a carrot. Um, and one of the things I do when I work with families is I try to talk to families and find out about the person, who they were, what they liked, um, what they didn't like. And I just try to bring them to life, I suppose, a bit before their inquest, write a blog, introduce them, make sure that they're not just their death. That's not all we remember them from. And the thing about Peter is Peter, um, Peter hated carrots. And he aspirated um, and he, when they did the post-mortem, they found a carrot in his, in his windpipe. So I don't know what's more insulting, what's more offensive, the fact that he had such poor care, having been taken away from his family who'd provided his care all his life because the social worker didn't like the fact his sister smoked. What's more offensive, the fact that he died prematurely or the fact that he died and he had a carrot in his windpipe and he didn't even like carrots. I mean, go figure for personalized care. And then this last one, I mean, I don't even know why I said I can't imagine a more awful way to die because we shouldn't do the top trumps really, because actually, if you die from chronic constipation or fecal impaction, that is a horrific way to die as well. Um, and one of the earliest inquests I did was Richard Handley's inquest. And if you don't know about what happened to Richard Handley, I'd recommend um, doing, having a Google and finding out about it because Richard um, was 
Richard had a very physical problem, a constipation problem, and everyone around him, um, except his family, were completely ignoring, it just assumed that his behaviour changes were because he was having a psychiatric episode. Um, and to cut an incredibly long story short, um, Richard um, was taken to an ATU for assessment and a brilliant CPN um, look, took one look at him and said, this, this man's ill, he's physically ill. And he bundled him into his car, drove him across the car park and took him to Ipswich Hospital, um, where they then, um, according to the coroner, similarly missed opportunities to save his life and their poor care. About five agencies were involved in Richard's life and death um, and they all failed him. Um, so he didn't survive, but yeah. These are, but the thing is, what other group, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. The last thing that people die from, um, malnutrition in hospital settings. Um, and this comes up quite a bit. I've done two inquests in recent years, Joe O'Leary, who died in the Manchester Royal Infirmary, and Laura Booth, who died in the Royal Howlandshire Hospital in Sheffield. Um, and again, I can provide links to the um, reports to my website where I've written up these inquests or to the coroner's findings in Laura's inquest which was actually quite um, detailed and very clear on diagnostic overshadowing and some of what went wrong. Effectively, people are not seen as fully human. So to boil it down, healthcare staff are forgetting that people need fed at one level because they're just not seen as fully human. So they're, they're just not seen as um, basic needs aren't met. Um, and a lot of this slide, a lot of what people actually die from but over time they die they are in hospital and often poor health care or poor access to health care is absolutely key but just to kind of not let anybody here feel very comfortable about it people as Wolfensberg talked about death making there's also an awful lot happens before people's the end very end of their lives social care is not is not good for this group either and so I will talk a lot about healthcare because that's often what the inquests focus on, but there is so much omissions of care and there is so much apathy, and I'll touch on it a little bit in a moment, um, before anybody even reaches the end of their life. Um, so these are some stats from the leader reports about who's at higher risk of dying. I'm not gonna go through them in any great detail, the slides you'll be able to see later, just to say, effectively, the more disabled you are, the greater the chance you're going to die early. And before somebody goes, that's because people are really disabled, you don't, on the whole, die as a result of your disability. You die as a result of poor care. Some people uh, with a profound multiple disability will have a shortened lifespan, sure, but whether they should die, have a 6.4 times greater likelihood that they die early or not, I don't know. Um, and likewise, if you're from a Black or minority ethnic background, the colour of your skin should not really make a difference to um, your life expectancy, but we actually know in the general population it does as well. So if you're um, if you have a learning disability or you're autistic and you're also um, from a Asian or an Asian British background, you have 9.2 times greater likelihood that you're going to die prematurely and before you before you reach 50. I mean, these are horrendous stats. Um, and again, if you're subject to mental health or criminal justice restriction in five years before your death, so if you've been detained um, in an ATU, for example, you're, again, more likely to die prematurely. I mean, uh, Siobhan was mentioning that hospitals are risky places when you're not well. Hospitals are really risky if you have a learning disability. And when you're behind a locked door and you are removed from your families and friends and support networks, um, and lots of people who end up in learning disability assessment and treatment units end up there because they have mental ill health. So they're having some mental health crisis. So then the stats about mental health are layered on top of the stats around learning disability. And it's, it's frightening. It's, it, I just don't have better words for it really. It's frightening. Um, so this, this slide here is about, um, and I'm gonna to refer to my notes because I don't know this as well as the other stuff, but this is some really recent research that came out in October and it was research around COVID. Um, and it was two articles, one in the BMJ and one in the Lancet. Um, I'm just gonna talk you very quickly through the BMJ article. Um, it looked at the hospital journey of 506 people um, who, with a learning disability who were admitted to hospital with COVID. And this is utterly horrific. And I still can't quite understand why there wasn't more of an outrage at the time. So we have 506 people who've been admitted and they were matched to a control group, so 506 people who didn't have a learning disability. And a quarter of those admissions were people under 40. Um, 
And on admission, learning disabled patients were sicker by the time they were admitted. So they were late being admitted into hospital. But before they caught COVID, they were healthier than the control group. So th this lovely narrative around underlying conditions, the patients with a learning disability, their quality of life, they were actually healthier before they caught COVID than the, when people without learning disability. In terms of medical complications, once they entered hospital, it was roughly equal between the two groups. Um, but when it came to the treatment received, people with a learning disability were 37% less likely to receive non-invasive respiratory support. They were 40% less likely to receive intubation and they were 50% less likely to be admitted to ICU. When matched with people who were having the same, the same level of illness. So for no reason other than they were learning disabled and people's biases and expectations and 50% less likely to be admitted to ICU. And so people with a learning disability admitted to hospital during COVID in this study had a 56% increased risk of dying from COVID after they were admitted to hospital. And once they adjusted for all different things, they were dying 1.4 times faster at any point once they were admitted to hospital than the other group, which from my perspective is just death making in action. And um, we know that there is an ongoing disparity in healthcare for learning disabled people, but it isn't just a healthcare issue, it is a social work and a social care issue. Just a few reflections, I'll run through them quickly because we've got um, other things to talk about, other um, Leah to hear from. Absence and apathy, I cannot comprehend how apathetic society is, social care is, social work is to these issues. When we were campaigning for Justice for LB, the absolute silent professional voice throughout most of our campaigning was social, was social work. It, it just didn't seem to spark a fire with people. And that's not all, obviously, none of my statements, they're sweeping statements, none of them are all, but there has never been as much outrage as I would expect or hope um, from this profession, in my experience, and maybe I just have a bad experience. Um, just wanted to quickly mention language and professionalism. Um, bear in mind, those of you who are um, practicing social workers, any of your records, any of your um, language, any of what you say and do in your daily work can be read out in a courtroom. And I am repeatedly appalled at how I hear parents referred to, um, reference to mum or dad, reference to, um, really unprofessional things that you should I just can't believe people thought was appropriate to say never mind to write down and um, I think there's people hide behind the notion of professionalism but I, I just think it, it, I just think there's some I've just got some horrendous examples I could find you tweets of lots of tweets of what people have said and um, this issue about record keeping just bear in mind that anything you write can be shared and um and why are you writing it anyway? Um, performative scrutiny, we have lots of reports, we have lots of assessments, someone dies, lots of people claim to want to get to the bottom of it, um, but nothing ever changes. Um, so I think it's, um, I do think it's performative scrutiny. I think it's something to be seen to be doing something as opposed to really getting to the bottom of things. Um, so my final couple of points are about, um, I often wonder about what we can do differently and it's a bit of a struggle because I am effectively, um, I am crowdsourced by amazing people who pay for my time and my expenses to do this work. But then I go into a courtroom and I just blast out horrific, horrific um, lives and deaths of people. Um, and I hate it at one level. And I, I'm often asked, well, what should we do differently? And I think pretty much the only thing we can do differently is to live and love defiantly and to, to keep visible at those who we know and love and just be out there and, see people as fully human and insist on it don't hide away don't don't um just be just be what we want i don't want i don't want the society we've got i want a better future i want this to be different and i think we all have to kind of be the change that we want to see i know it's a bit cheesy but i just don't have any other answer i'm sorry um and then that's just my final slide which was a slightly better stitching which was left in birmingham um uh, a couple of years ago and i just think it's worth remembering that our lives do begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you. Thank you so much, um, George. I, I meant to say when I was introducing you that uh, yeah, I first became aware of your work um, 
from the Justice for LB campaign and I've followed it ever since. And I hope that everybody who's here will follow you on Twitter and follow um, the, the brilliant work that you do. And thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna move on really quickly because we've still got quite a lot to get through. So, but thank you so much um, for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. And I hope that people all, you know, there are questions that if, if, if people want questions, please do go into the Q&A and George will share uh, our answers with you, I'm sure. So we've talked there, and George has really articulately talked about adults with learning disabilities. We've talked about how death making applies to people who are devalued, people with learning disabilities, people with mental health problems. But death making, we could also think about how death making actually can be seen as, you know, where people's lives are. If we go back to what um, Wolfensberger said, people's lives are abbreviated, and sometimes that this impacts on whole communities of people. So, um, you know, avoidable deaths on a, um, on a large scale at once. So going back to Aberfan, um, which, uh, you know, the, the, the picture there of the clock um, every year, I think of that. Um, and Hillsborough, um, if people have been watching Anne on television, it tells, um, you know, one aspect of one person's story from Hillsborough, which demonstrates really that whole process of what we think coroners are going to do and actually what coroners do do and the whole coronial process, I think. Um, and social workers need to know more about that and understand more about that lack of candour and lack of honesty that George talked about there. And then perhaps the most recent of these examples is the Grenfell Tower example, um, which you'll all know and you'll probably all remember as I do watching that unfold. And so um, our um, next special guest um, is Leah, who is going to tell us a little bit about some of her work, um, linking that into Grenfell, but some fascinating work as a social worker. So let's look here at what social work is about and what social work can do. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Leah. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. If we could start the presentation. And thanks for that, George. That was just amazing that what you do and everything you've shared with us. So I've titled this um, presentation, A Collective Community Response to a Community Tragedy. And um, we can move on to the next slide, Siobhan. I just want to say um, before I start this presentation that it's really, the reflection is as a social worker and a practitioner, but also as um, a resident of RBKC and living within the Lancaster West Award growing up. And so there's really, it's very, this is very personal as well as professional for me. So there'll be some sort of um, some reflections during this time. So just a, a quick bit about my background. My career started off in RBKC, Royal Borough of Kensington in Chelsea. I did lots and lots of work there. I worked there for about 12 years and did a lot of um, sort of the pre and the post Grenfell um, work with specifically young people and children and families. Um, I've then worked in secure estates and managed and led services um, in secure estates and youth offending institutes, done some work around palliative care, youth offending teams, and also did gang intervention um, in Haringey Council. And I'm now in sit in the mayor, in the mayor of London's office in the violence reduction unit, and I've also and continue to do voluntary work at Bay Twenty, which is a community hub which sits in the the heart of the community of Grenfell. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context. I think we've spoken quite a lot around um, death making, but I think it's important to this slide to understand life through a lens of the survivors and life through a lens of the community. A lot of, um, you know, um, residents in RBKC would have had a background of adverse childhood experiences. I'm sure we know what that all is. You know, there'll be um, mental health that they would have, um, you know, been diagnosed or gone through. And we saw, a, I saw a lot of that within my work. But this tragedy, there was another layer where we see intersectionality, where we have the the inequity of housing, where we have this, this tragedy that impacted on, you know, an enormous community that was very, very tight knit. But prior to this, there were um, the, the, the relationship with the TMO, which was the landlord, was very, very fractured and they were they were dehumanized and their voices were not heard when they were complaining about various different repairs and things going on in the um, in the Grenfell Tower. 
So their beliefs were determined from, from what they saw because they, their voice was not valued, their voice was not heard. And so they had been looking at life through the lens of, of trauma. And so we know that psychosocial views, they frame our world, our belief system and our cultural influences. And when you have young people living at, or just families, you know, you have people living in these environments, what it's saying to them is we don't care about you. We don't care if your life is in danger because we're not fixing the pipes or we're not, we're not you know, fixing things that could be, you know, detrimental to your health or, you know, could, could result in death. We don't care. To the next slide, please. So what I want to say here is that moving on to the grief, bereavement and trauma slide, that the relationship with the TMO, because I work um, with social landlords now, and a lot of the time what happens is stock is transferred over to housing associations. And in the, um, in the case of Grenfell, that's what happened. And the TMO landlord, I was actually a tenant of TMO myself also, were not making any any new repairs that they were supposed to in the actual building and they formed the Grenfell Action Group which I've been honoured to meet and you know be a part of with the residents and the Action Group predicted in 2016 this is a direct quote from the Action Group that it won't be long before the words of this blog come back to haunt the KCTMO management and we will do everything in our power to ensure that those in authority know how long and how appallingly our landlord has ignored their responsibility to ensure the health and safety of their tenants and leaseholders. They can't say that they haven't been warned and that was in 2016. So their voice was completely not heard. This was something that could have been preventable but it was, it was not prevented and this was years and years of years of resident group meetings, campaigning and Grenfell is an example that ended in tragedy, but there are so many residents in RBKC who are living in unlivable conditions. So moving on to the grief, bereavement and trauma. So a lot of obviously the survivors, you know, experience complicated grief, but also the community experience complicated grief because where Grenfell sits in um, that in, in Labrook Grove and the Latimer Ward, it's actually the heart of the community. So no matter where you are surrounding it, you don't have to be in Latimer to see Grenfell. It's, it's actually what we call the heart of, of, of our, of our um, community. And so you can see that wherever, wherever you are. So there's a constant reminder of that tragedy. There's that constant reminder that the government don't care about you. And, 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 and this is what happens because there's a total disregard for life. So there's that unresolved trauma and, you know, this prior to um, pre-Grenfell, you know, there was a lot of, we had to deal with a lot of different um, mental health diagnosis and a lot of support. But after this, this, is, this has resulted in more comorbid, comorbid, comorbidities around mental health. There's a lack of, you know, readiness for death. There's a difficulty in making sense of the death. And what I noticed is that there's a lot of more high level kind of negative thoughts when I was working in some of the units. I'm working alongside some of the survivors' family, for example. There was um, a young girl when I did the um, violence of affecting women and girls. There was a young girl who lost her sister her her, and her two nieces in the fire. And so there's that impactful kind of forceful death that's unexpected. And the impact of that leads to that complicated grief and the post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of what happened was the kind of external community were not really given that support and a lot of the mental health is even undiagnosed to this day and there are you know young people specifically the younger sort of generation who haven't sought any mental health um, support and they've completely um, sort of disassociated from getting that support and so we see a, we're seeing a lot of that now in the borough so I just wanted to if I've quickly got time when I um, worked within palliative care, I started to draw on the comparisons between the work at Grenfell and looking at the, um, the, the grief theory and really linking those two together and looking at the psychodynamic approaches and how that fit and how that sit in with the work that we're doing. But also, interestingly, when we talk about, you know, um, grief, bereavement and trauma, or we talk about end of life, um, you know, sometimes you 
you, you look at strengths-based approach and you don't think that that could actually be used. But actually, in my work, there was the, the young girl that I'm talking about who um, lost her sister and her two nieces actually started up um, a photography project called Golden Ashes. And I can, I can get that, that link to, to share. And it was just beautiful photography from survivors and the area. And it was her way of her, it was, it, was, it was therapeutic for her. It was her way of working through her grief. So you can actually use strengths, you know, the strengths of the, the bereaved to actually help them through that healing process. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to talk about um, the grieving community and deprivation. So prior to Grenfell, it was for residents, survival of the fittest. And I've heard lots of young people and lots of adults, you know, talking about survival of the fittest. So the ideology of a broken society has been exasperated by inequality, which has been advanced by conservative government over time. And these neoliberal ideologies are caused to create you know, certain social policies which result in cuts to public services and welfare, and it causes social disorganisation. ACEs in itself, this is what my argument was when I wrote my um, systematic review, that ACEs in itself, that is an adverse experience, the environment in which people grow up in, you know, when we look at that. And I think Siobhan kind of touched on that earlier. So arguably the creation of these social housing estates and the racial inequalities of populations are interwoven within this and have formed the notion of the welfare ghetto. So this is a reality, not only in the Grenfell victims' lives and the RP, RBKC residents' lives, but it's everyday lives for hundreds and thousands of res residents living in social housing and deprivation all over the country. So what we saw was, a grieving community but that grieving community was nationwide it was worldwide because people could empathize with that there were people living in towers like that there were people with that same that same issue where they had that social that social housing inequity and so I thought it was really important to mention that and we saw I just want to highlight something quickly because this was really quite um it was a breakthrough that there were, there's two gangs that don't get, get along in the borough and they let the gang members come into the borough to give donations. So we saw real barriers being broken down because you know, it was such a tragic event. So the deep rooted structural issues such as inequality, poverty, um, disadvantage, which have been compounded by cuts. I think the youth service had got cut, the social care service had, had got cut. There was not really an existing youth service at this time. And there was a lot of services that had been cut and a lot of um, community buildings were being privatised and sold to private schools, etc. And a lot of that was going on right before um, Grenfell. So these, the formation of, of estates, the formation of these social housing clusters have contributed to the increase in the further dehumanisation and the marginalisation of these communities. And we see that in full effect here. So this is a broken society. And the systems that are put in place, are, it's a system that has set people up to fail. So on just a quick bit about data, because I know Siobhan took us through a bit of data. Um, this is an area in terms of Grenfell and, and this ward. When we talk about this ward, there's clusters of estates around Grenfell that make up the Lan Lancaster West Ward and the walkways. And so they're all around Grenfell. So this was a whole community that had experienced it. We had seen mothers throwing their babies outside of the window onto mattresses. We had seen people jumping out of the windows, you know, with blazing in fire. And because the community is very small, everybody came out to see it. And within a matter of about 20 minutes, the whole community were there. So on the basis of the government's own data, this is an area of absolute deprivation, but it is also one of the richest areas in the country, making the extent of relative deprivation staggering. So the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea is among the most unequal with extreme poverty and wealth living side by side. I always said that growing up in RBKC, you be somewhere one minute and then you're on King's Road and you're seeing a, a million pound Ferrari. It's, it's very, very close, that disparity. And um, the data shows that the, the vicinity of the tower was among the top 10% most deprived areas in England in 2015. So the constituency of Kensington, which makes up makes up most of the local authority of Kensington and Chelsea is the wealthiest in England but then we can see that 
we have the most deprived in the top 10%. So you can see here from the, the statistics, the disproportionality. So just moving on to the, to the last slide, I wanna just talk about the intervention for Grenfell community. So um, during that time, you know, the pre-Grenfell work, I was working with um, the young people and um, I was the intensive lead personal advisor there for young people with learning diff difficulties, disabilities and mental health. And then as the time went on, the role really grew after, after Grenfell basically became sort of like the mental health lead because there were so many um, cases of young people where by, you know, they, they had so, so much, so many... Um, tragic events and I felt underskilled and I felt like I needed to go and um, go back to study because I needed to understand where the victims were coming from. I needed to understand the theories. I needed to understand how to help them. And that's where um, I started the career in, in social work and was really able to give back to the community. And that leads into the Bay 20 Centre, which was a centre, that a community centre, which was rebuilt after the Grenfell tragedy. And there we um, we have street kitchens, so we've done that in the pandemic. That was done six days a week during the pandemic. We have an IAG service there, which supports with housing and debt and any advice, really. So it's really just a hub where residents can come if they need support, if they just want a place to, to talk. And then also, um, I, I led on a lot of the violence against women and girls work. But I just want to say here quickly that where they set up the Grenfell response team, the community rejected that and still don't work very well with the Grenfell response team because they didn't want any handouts. They didn't want anything from the government. It was people like myself, my colleagues who had worked in the, um, the uh, community for decades. And so they didn't see us as being employed by the local authority. And so they accepted the help. And so that's the community action. We had to come together as a community to almost pick ourselves up and put those broken pieces back together. Okay, last slide, please, Siobhan. So I just always leave with this quote because we're working with really vulnerable people and, you know, um, it, these people are experts of their lives. We can't just come in and tell them and have our prejudgments and treat them any way that we want to. So I leave you with this Maya Angelou quote that, People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So as you're working with um, service users, please remember that they will always remember how you made them feel. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for telling us about the work that you do, which is such important work. And also, I think what you were able to bring to us there was the difference that social work can be in communities and how you know um death making is also about communities being basically living in that shadow of death and that all of the things you've talked about and even as you started to mention they're working with women experiencing violence you know we know that women experience violence and they're dying because of that violence so there's so much here about the way in which people are devalued um, in society and by governments and that creating death making and what we should be doing as social workers. So remember that we started this topic as death making. What is it? Is it a social work issue? It's a theoretical concept, but we know it's there. We've got all of this research behind it. We've got lots of practice as well that's been shared there from Leah. This is about death linked to devaluation. That's what it's all about. That's what we're talking about. And that's why anti-oppressive practice, rights-based practice, social justice, it is a life and death issue. It's not something that we should be playing around with as social workers. And death making is something that we do need to know about, that we do need to reflect on. And think about all of the themes that come together in all of the different shared stories tonight. I've just done my first quarter of my CPD. I'm registered with Social Work England and we should do a quarterly CPD. And I've just done my first one and I did it about watching Four Lives. I don't know if anybody else has watched the television program. I think it's been um, very, very well done. I don't normally like those kinds of programs, but I think it's been very well done. Um, and it covered the death of um, Stephen Port's victims. Um, so he killed four gay men. And the final three men that died their deaths were completely and utterly preventable. 
but it was because of, I think, undeniably institutional homophobia um, within the police force that enabled those three deaths. And I think, you know, when we look at um, the huge amount of institutional oppression that there is, it's that devaluation, that oppression, that discrimination that leads into death making. If you've not watched the programme, I think it'd be a really interesting um, television drama for you to watch. We know as well about, you know, we've talked a lot in our webinars about Black Lives Matter. And that's also, I mean, you know, the, the campaign started in America, um, um, you know, well before the murder of George Floyd, but it, it, it gathered momentum after the, the murder of George Floyd and became more well known around the world. And that is also about death making. So all of these things, they're about early death, preventable death that's linked to devaluation. The final thing that I want to say that I think is another theory that links very closely into death making is the theory of responsabilization. It's my view that although Wolfensberger didn't say this in his initial writing about death making, but it's my view that a key aspect of death making is when people are effectively made responsible for their own deaths by governments, by, you know, Leah talked about neoliberalism and, and it's when, when governments and people in power create this, oh, it's their fault that they died. So, you know, think about what was said about uh, at Hillsborough, about it was the fans fault, you know, they were drunk, they were this, they were that, that's why all of that. And think about the years and years it took for the families to fight for justice and the fact that they still don't have justice. They've had some truth, they've had, you know, new inquests, but there's still no justice. And think about the impact that that has had, the trauma for communities, as Leah talked about. And my fear about the current pandemic is that politicians and the elite are effectively setting out conditions to blame people for their own deaths. So it's almost like, um, you know, uh, did you have you noticed that during the pandemic, particularly politicians, they always added the word sad to deaths. There have been sadly death, always, always, always add this word. It's always like there's an adjective that's added. But there were underlying health conditions, you know, and it's a phrase that fills me with fear because I have an underlying health condition. I would say of the people who are here now, I'd say, there's, there's a lot of you that would struggle to say that you don't have an underlying health condition because many people do have something. It doesn't mean that we aren't fit and well, but it gives this underlying ripple around death making. And remember that when you see about and hear about the deaths from COVID, this is a political decision. It is about politics. You know, that phrase that Leah used about survival of the fittest and that being this hugely neoliberalist thing. It is. It is a thing about, well, you know, if you've got an underlying health condition or it's it's almost like it's kind of your own fault. And this is really it's, it's easy for people to say, oh, this is about systems. This is about institutions. This is about hospitals. It's about systems or whatever. But systems are made up of people. And so the only people that can bring about change are us. You know, how are we learning the lessons? I keep hearing that phrase all the time. You know, a bit like um, George said earlier, do we know enough yet? You know, have we had enough lessons yet? We're not learning them. And I think we have to, all of us, take responsibility for that. We are all part of a system. And we are the people who can bring about change. Interestingly, um, George and Leah didn't see each other's slides and I didn't necessarily see the slides before I ended and I'd already done my slides when I started theirs in. It's interesting, George ended on a quote, Leah ended on a quote and I'm going to end on a quote and I'm going to end on a quote from, um, you know, somebody who I just admire so much and is just one of my role models, you know, Leah ended on um, Maya Angelou, one of my role models, I'm going to end with Caroline Aldridge and Caroline says, as a quote from her book, He Died Waiting, these are widespread behaviors. Large organizations do not seem to have a corporate conscience. And Caroline says, I want to prompt others to start seeing that as a society, we have created the conditions for death rates to rise. That is death making. We have created these conditions as a society. 
And what I'd say to you is, we are social workers. We have to change those conditions. We have to stop preventable deaths. So lots of you came to this webinar tonight not knowing what death making was. I hope that tonight has given you some insight into what death making is. I hope that tonight has made you angry. I hope that tonight has given you some outrage. I hope that tonight means that you will start to think about what can I do to change these conditions. When you start thinking there's nothing I can do, you're no longer a social worker. Social work is about change. What are we gonna do? to change this? What are we going to do to stop preventable deaths? So thank you so much to our two guests, George and Leah, who have brought us two very different ways of thinking about death making, but both have brought us something for us to think about and take away. So thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who has come tonight to a topic you didn't know what it was about. What, what is this all about? And when people were asking me, I thought, well, I can't tell you what it is, really. You just need to come and then find out what it is, you know, because it's something that you need. You can't, I can't answer it in a tweet what it is. And I hope tonight has given you that. You know that we always end our sessions by letting you know what's coming next and what's coming over the next few weeks. And I think the link for next week's session for you to register will be going into the chat now. Next week, we are delighted to be joined by one of the people that we gave a Be The Difference Award to last year, Adam Padgett. Adam is going to come and talk to us about, uh, well, Adam's going to lead the whole session next week. And Adam's a newly qualified social worker. And he's going to share a hugely inspirational story. And he's titled it, My Past Gives Me purpose and next week will be a massively inspirational webinar thank you so much to everybody for attending tonight please do get outraged please do go and do something about this thank you everybody and good night <laughs>